Chapter 2 Baba's Earliest Period The birth and parentage of Sai Baba are wrapped in mystery. We have not come across a single person who has any direct knowledge of them. Sai attained his fame at Shirdi in the Bombay state by the end of the 19th century, when he was already gray. It is known that he was not a native of Shirdi. He was very young when he first came there. In the beginning, he left Shirdi off and on and returned to it. The date of his first arrival at Shirdi cannot be fixed. A very old lady, the mother of Nana Chokdar, said in 1900 that when she was young, she saw Sai Baba first at Shirdi, and then he was prepossessing an attractive lad at the time, without mustache. Probably he was in his early teens. That so little is known about his early life proves that even then he was leading a secluded life, a real fakur, a true sadhu, not hankering after the good things of the world, but concentrating his attention on higher aims. He was often in solitude, not infrequently under the well-known margosa tree, called the sweet margosa. Because the leaves of one of its two big branches are not so bitter as margosa leaves usually are, and as the leaves of other big branches are. Baba had no fixed residence. Real fakurs have none. He would roam about into the fields and squat at any tree foot and had no interest in any worldly matter. One of his later visits to Shirdi, probably the final visit, was on the momentous occasion of Chan Bai Patel's advent to Shirdi. Chan Bai Patel was a rich and influential village Patel or headman of the Dupkeda village in Nizam state, not far from Shirdi. His wife's nephew had to be married to a bride at Shirdi, and so about in the year 1872 he came with a huge procession at night or in the evening, and Sai Baba accompanied him on that occasion to Shirdi. After that, except for two months when he was under Jawar Ali Mulana, Sai Baba never left Shirdi, but only made a few occasional visits off and on to the neighboring village of Rahata, from where he immediately returned to Shirdi. So his final residence was Shirdi from about 1872 till the end of his life in 1918. He discouraged questions on parentage and mostly gave mystifying answers. On one occasion, he said his father was Purusha and his mother was Maya or Prakriti, and that in consequence, he came in as the, into the world of phenomena. And at another time, he said his uncle, had brought him to Shirdi from Aurangabad. On one momentous occasion, very late in his life, he revealed to Malsapathi the interesting fact that his parents were Brahmins of Patri in the Nizam state. Patri is part of the Parvani Taluk and near Manwath. Sai Baba added in explanation of the fact that he was living in a mosque that while still a tender child, his Brahmin parents handed him over to the care of a Fakur who brought him up. This is fairly indisputable testimony, as Malsapathi was a person of sterling character, noted for his integrity, truthfulness, and vairagya, dispassion. All persons, including Sai Baba, H.S. Dixit, and others held him in very high esteem, and none would doubt his veracity. Sai Baba occasionally showed his interest in Patri and Parvani, when people from those parts came to him, by questioning them about the residents of those places. This does not take us very far, 
But this is practically all that we have about the birth and parentage of Sri Sai Baba. But whoever his parents were, it is quite important to remember that from his earliest infancy, he had all the association or disassociation or detachment of a true varagi or jnani should have. Having no parents or kinsmen and being brought up by a fakur, he easily picked up his foster father's dispassion and spiritual turn of mind. Even that Fakur passed away within four or five years after taking charge of him. The Fakur directed his wife to take the young child Baba and leave him in charge of a noted saintly Zaminder, a Gopal Rao Desmuk, at Selu. The appellation Desmuk was not meaningless in the case of Gopal Rao, but denoted an actual appointment at Deshmukh, or the provincial governor for the Jintur Pargana, and the title or sonad of Deshmukh had been conferred on him by the descendants of the Peshwas. The exact date of the title cannot be discovered. There are ballads and some old manuscripts in the possession of Desmukhs descendants which show that somewhere about the first quarter of the last century, the Peshwas recognized his military capacity, which enabled him, that is, Gopal Rao, to bring Jintur Pargana under his control with his own horsemen and other followers. Young Baba, left under the care of this Gopal Rao Desmukh, spent the best and the most impressionable part of his life at Selu which was the center of that Pargana, and which had a fort and castle wherein the Desmuk resided. The young boy was very greatly attached to his master, and the master in turn was deeply interested in the boy. Consequently, the boy was with the master at all times, whether the latter was in the field or at Puja, whether he was in the garden or in the court, Baba seems to have had no education given to him at any time, that is, no book study, and no masters either in the regional language, which must have been Marathi or Telugu, or in any other language. But real education of the highest sort he had in plenty. For this Desmuk, unlike many other Desmuks or Zamindars of his times, was not a dissolute and sensuous person of brutal nature, reveling in cruelty and violation of all moral rules or scruples. On the other hand, he was an extremely pious devotee, greatly attached to Tirupati Venkatesa, whose image he daily worshipped in his own castle. He was rich and liberal, and patronized learning and piety. Hence, an abundance of real education could be picked up by the young child Baba when attending on his master. The Desmuk's worship of Venkatesa was not of the ordinary sort. He had direct communion with the Ishtadiva, and the guidance of that Ishtadiva in all his affairs made his life a remarkable spiritual and temporal success. He maintained his political sovereignty against all odds, and the ballads of his time show that his regiment was greatly esteemed and feared. Esteemed by the Peshwas, whom he helped, and feared by the Muslim Nizam, whom he opposed. This Desmuk, however, spent much of his time in holy pastimes. He went around visiting holy places, and at one of those places, a remarkable, a remarkable incident took place showing his nature. He occupied with his retainers a haunted house. The original owner of the house had died, and because a Brahma Raksha, who would appear suddenly at midnight and kill the occupants. But Gopal Rao, the devout worshipper of Venkatesa, was not afraid. He carried on the puja of Venkatesa and Salagram right up to the middle of the night. The evil spirit, disheveled and hairy all over, appeared and demanded in a terrific voice, 
Who are you? How dare you come to my house? Then Gopal Rao coolly replied that the statement that the house was his was a mistake when there was nothing in common between him and the materials making up the house. The spirit, infuriated, tried to approach him, though with some fear. Gopal Rao waited, and when the spirit came within a few yards, hurled the abhishtakam water on the head of that spirit. At once this effected a marvelous change. The spirit fell down prostrate and recited its past history and prayed that Gopal Rao should take possession of the vast hordes of wealth which the spirit had made when alive, and which it had kept in the house, and watched and utilized all that to release it from its Brahma Raksha state. Gopal Rao agreed and carried away the treasures to Kasi, where he performed the requisite rites for the liberation of the Brahma Rakshas. Another noteworthy incident in his travels was at Ahmabad. There, at the tomb of Suvag Shah, which he approached, a remarkable incident occurred. The tomb actually perspired with joy and spoke to him. It stated that he, Gopal Rao, was formerly Ramananda of Kasi, and that now he had become a Grihasta, a householder and a ruler. But all the same, his former devotee Kabir would be coming to him soon. It was after this that young Baba was brought to him by the Fakur's widow, and Gopal Rao recognized him as Kabir. Amongst the influences that mold the character of young boys, perhaps the strongest is that of the father or the mother living with them and shaping their mind from hour to hour. Baba had no mother nor father to mold him, but he had first a foster father, the Fakur, and next a master who ultimately became his Diksha Guru. So the nature and character of Gopal Rao Deshmukh must first be understood to know how Baba's nature and character developed. This Gopal Rao, though as a minder of rural chieftain of ancient days, maintained a character and reputation unattained by any other zamindar of his time. One incident in his life, mentioned in the legendary history quoted earlier, illustrates this point. One evening, as he sat on the ramparts of his fort, it was quite dusk, and in that half-darkness, a fair damsel of some twenty years came very close to the ramparts on the ground level and thinking that there was nobody, sat down and exposed her body. Seeing the nude is provocative of lust. Others in his position would have immediately ordered someone to go and carry away the damsel and bring her for their gratification. With Gopal Rao, the sinful impulse lasted only for a moment. His conscience rebelled, and he at once thought of Venkatesa and appealed to him for forgiveness. He viewed every woman other than his wife as really in the position of a mother to him. That is, no lustful thought should be directed to any person other than one's wife. So treating this lustful thought as an enormous sin, he rapidly went down to his worship room, and there, before his Ishtadiva's image, Venkatesa, he repented with bitter tears this momentary lust, and then resolved to punish his eyes for having cast lustful glances at a mother, which is nothing short of incest. He at once seized two sharp needles and poked his eyes with them. Blood issued, and he moaned. His relations soon came up, and noting the fact, blamed him for the folly of losing his eye for such a trivial matter. As his eyesight was absolutely essential for guarding them and the Jintur Pargana from the Muslims, and as the eyes were necessary also for purposes of worship, his guru asked him to pray to Lord Venkatesa for recovery of sight. Accordingly, he prayed and recovered sight. The fame of his purity, nobility of character, and ability to draw Venkatesa's power for curing ailments spread abroad. 
Blind people and others came to him, and his very touch was curative. To a woman born blind, he applied chilies to her eyes with Venkatesa's name on his lips. This cured her and restored her sight. This incident therefore shows the nature and characteristics of Baba's guru, Gopal Rao Dushma. In his highest moments of absorption, Gopal Rao uttered words which were the words of Venkatesa. He became one with Venkatesa at that time. So Baba always referred to his guru as Venkusa, a contraction of Venkatesa. The perfect chastity, thorough self-control, invariable rectitude, perfect truthfulness, generosity, and serviceability to all, which were the leading characteristics of the guru, became transplanted and took deep root in the disciple Sri Sai Baba. We shall see next proceed to narrate how the full personality, including curative power, descended from the Guru to Baba. Baba's being favored by the Master evoked considerable jealousy amongst the Guru's retainers, and some of them resolved to kill young Baba by hurling brickbats at him. During a Chaturmasya from August to November, Gopal Rao was in a garden, and young Baba was attending upon him. The villains hurled bricks at Baba. One of the bricks came very near Baba's head, but the Guru saw it, and by his order it stood still in mid-air, unable to proceed further or hit Baba. Another man threw a second brick to hurt Baba, but Gopal Rao got up and got the brick on his head, this led to profuse bleeding. Baba was moved to tears, and he begged his master to send him away, as the master was getting harm from his unfortunate company. But the master declined to send him away. As for the injury, the master bandaged it with a shred torn from his own cloth, and then suddenly he said, I see that the time has come for me to part with you. Tomorrow at 4 p.m. I shall leave this body not as a result of this injury, but my, my own power of Swacha Marana. Therefore, I shall now vest my full spiritual personality in you. For that purpose, fetch milk from yonder black cow. Young Baba went to Hula, the Lombadi in charge of the cow, who pointed out that the cow was barren, had not calved and could not therefore yield milk. All the same, he came with the cow to the chieftain, Gopal Rao, who just touched it from horns to tail, and told the Lombadi, now pull out the teats. The Lombadi's pull drew out plenty of milk, and this milk was given to Baba with Gopal Rao's blessing, that the full power and grace of the Guru should pass on to the young Baba. This was the diksha, the investure, the true initiation of the guru's personality, which young Baba underwent. So far as mystic powers were concerned, the Shakti Nipada, immediately an opportunity arose for proving the transfer of power. The villain whose brickbat had hit Gopal Rao, the chieftain, fell down dead the moment Gopal Rao was hit. His companions were horrified, and they came with repentance to Gopal Rao's feet and prayed for pardon not only for themselves, but also for their dead companion, whom they requested Gopal Rao to revive. The chieftain pointed out that the power of revival now rested in the young man and that they should appeal to him. They accordingly appealed, and Baba took some of the dust of his guru's feet and placed it on the corpse. The dead man rose at once. The Guru's declaration that he would pass away the next day from his life into the beyond was fulfilled. After making the fullest preparations for settling all his temporal affairs, Gopal Rao, with his full consciousness, sat up in the midst of a religious group carrying on puja and bhajan in the presence of his Ishta Diva. 
Sri Venkatesa, and at the solemn hour he had himself fixed for departure, his soul left in perfect peace and happiness, just as is stated in the Srimad Bhagavata. Before leaving the body, the master waved his hand westward to the young boy and bade him leave Selu and proceed westward to his new abode. Shirdi lies on the banks of the Godavari, due west of Selu, and Baba, by slow degrees, moved on from place to place and arrived at Shirdi, and after some time made it his permanent residence. <laughs>